1816, Queen Victoria's uncle, Prince Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, married Princess Charlotte of Wales, the daughter and heir of King George IV. As a wedding gift, the couple was given Claremont House in Esher, where they lived until Princess Charlotte's untimely death in childbirth in 1818. Among their staff was a groundsman, George Brough, and his wife, a kitchen maid, Mary Ann, whose father also served as a coachman to Prince Leopold. In 1831, the widowed Prince Leopold was chosen as King of the Belgians, but although he moved to Brussels, he retained his English property and his staff. The Bruffs continued to work for him, living in a comfortable cottage on the Claremont estate, where they raised their numerous children. When, in 1841, George Bruff heard that Queen Victoria was seeking a wet nurse for her second child Bertie, the Prince of Wales, he recommended Mary Ann, who, he said, was quiet and temperate in her habits. Mary Ann began well, even attending the baby prince's christening, but by the time that Bertie was eight months old, the Queen and Prince Albert found her so morose, ill-tempered and stupid that they dismissed her from their service. For the next eleven years she lived quietly with her husband, giving birth to six more children, while George continued to tend the Oriental ponds for Claremont House's most recent occupants, the family of King Leopold's father-in-law, the deposed King Louis-Philippe of France. A week after the birth of her youngest child in 1852, 40-year-old Mary Ann suffered a stroke, which left her with a permanent speech impairment and temporary hemiplegia. From then onwards, she suffered from severe headaches, nosebleeds, and migraine-like symptoms, some of which her doctor, Mr. Izzard, believed were psychosomatic. He advised her to avoid all excitement, and for the next two years he regularly visited to provide her with a variety of medications. In spite of her ailments, her husband began to suspect that she was having an affair, and in the summer of 1854, he became so suspicious that he hired a detective to follow her. The detective reported that Mary Ann had met a man in a tavern, which later led the press to imply without any justification that she was working in a brothel. On hearing of her clandestine meeting, George was so angry that he left her and threatened to return soon afterwards to take the children with him. A few days later, two workmen were passing Mary Ann's cottage at six o'clock in the morning when they spotted a blood-soaked pillow hanging out of an upstairs window. Fearing that there had been an accident, they hammered on the door, and receiving no reply, brought a ladder to climb up to the bedroom. On the bed they found two children whose throats had been cut, and Mary Ann lying beside them in a similar condition. Moving into adjacent rooms, they found four more children, all of whom had been killed by the same method. Mr Izzard was summoned and confirmed that all six children were dead, but as Mary Ann was still breathing, he sent for a surgeon, Mr Mott, who stitched her windpipe, saving her life. Far from being grateful, Mary Ann gasped that she wished she had succeeded in killing herself. Although she was immediately arrested, her trial was postponed pending her recovery, and in the meantime her children were buried in a sombre ceremony in Esher. George Brough was so distraught that he had to be carried from the graveyard, while from her sick bed Mary Ann reiterated that she wished she too were dead. It is truly enough to make all the children of the village afraid of their mothers, remarked King Louis Philippe's son, and Queen Victoria could only shake her head in horror at the depraved life that Bertie's former wet nurse must have lived. When she was well enough to be interviewed by the police, Mary Ann gave no excuse for her actions, apart from explaining that she had felt a great black cloud around her. All the children, she said, had been asleep when she killed them, except for the youngest, who was wide awake, and consequently was harder to kill. She went on to explain that when she had finished her horrific task, I lay down and did myself. I can't tell you what occurred for some time after that, till I seemed weak and found myself on the floor. That nasty great black cloud was gone. Then I was thirsty, and I got a water bottle and drank. I fell in a sitting position. I sat a little while, and got up and saw the children, and it all came to me again. I wished to call, but I could not speak. I did not know what to do, so I went to the window and put something out to attract attention. 
Her neighbours were aghast that so devoted a mother could turn on her children, and during her trial at Guildford they attested that she had always treated them well. "'I have frequently seen the prisoner with her children,' said the workman who discovered the bodies, and she always appeared to be very good and kind to them. The psychiatrist, Dr Forbes Winslow, interviewed her prior to the trial, and gave evidence that, although she appeared perfectly rational during their conversation, her nosebleed and temporary paralysis were evidence of a congested brain. Cases of temporary insanity, resulting in a desire to commit murder or suicide, are very common, he said rather chillingly. I have known many instances where the patient has made an attack upon some near relative with whom he had previously been on the most affectionate terms, and it frequently occurs with mothers and children. In such cases the patient suddenly suffers under a strong homicidal impulse which he cannot control, and it has happened to me to hear a patient bitterly lament being under the influence of such an impulse. The impulse is generally stronger in proportion as the parties are more nearly and dearly connected to them, and to the previous affection existing between them. Mary Ann was found not guilty by reason of insanity, and ordered to be detained in Bedlam. Mary Ann's story, along with those of eighty other women, can be found in my new book, Murderesses in Victorian Britain, which is available in paperback and Kindle format. Thank you for listening. <laughs>